despite all the resistance uh, principles we've been talking about and advocating, chemical control is still hugely important in crop protection. And not only diseases, but also uh, against the insects and, and weeds. And I will show you some statistics just of the, uh, the global use of, of plant protection chemicals and the extent of it. Another comment I'd like to make is that some of the uh, pure scientists will refer to plant pathologists as spray gun botanists, which I don't really like, but some people will call us just, you know, people who spray. And uh, Dave, you will also remember a talk at our pathology conference two years ago from a person from a big multinational company who claimed that they only breed for yield and they spray for diseases. The emphasis on resistance is not as we would like to see it. Anyway, this is just a few general concepts. I cannot talk about specific chemicals because each country will have its own um, registered products, uh, but just we will run through a few principles just to refresh your memories and re reiterate a few important things. So there are a wide range of chemicals used in crop protection, ranging from just simple disinfectants. Also, bleach is, is very good in that regard, sodium hypochlorite. Then we have antibiotics and copper compounds for the bacterial pathogens, fumigants, nematicides, activators that will induce systemic acquired resistance, and then fungicides for the fungal pathogens can be applied as seed treatments, foliar fungicides, or soil drenches, basically. Why do we need these compounds? Firstly, we would like to establish a good crop, a good stand. That's the first step. Secondly, we want to increase the productivity and reduce the blemishes and the spots and make it attractive for the consumer. And then finally, to improve the storage life and the quality of our harvested products. So there are a few important reasons why we use these. Some key <laughs> concepts. A fungicide is an agent that kills or inhibits the growth of fun fungi or fungal-like organisms. And with the fungal-like organisms, we refer to the probably the oomycetes, uh, the Phytophthora, Pythiums, etc. Now, a fungicide can have several names. I'm not sure if you're all aware of the different naming systems, but there is, first of all, a long chemical name. Then there's a common name. The common name is usually some abbreviation of the long chemical name because it's very difficult to copy the long chemical name. You can see it there each time you want to talk about a particular product. So it, it gets a name, in this case, proteoconazole, which is the common name, and that particular product will also have a trade name, Prusaro, in, in, in this case. Uh, why do we need all, the, need all these different names? Because once the uh, patent for this particular product expires, anyone can manufacture this and produce this. So we may end up with several <coughs> trade names for the same active ingredient, and that could lead to confusion. So that's why we need different naming systems. There are also other names, uh, such as the empirical formula. There's a chemical <coughs> abstract number when it, it's, it's published for the first time, etc. Um, so the label, we can spend an entire lecture on the label and the importance of the label. It's a legal document, and there's a lot of information on there. Uh, in this particular case, we have two active ingredients. The active ingredient would correspond to the common name. We have proteoconazole and teviconazole. And this is also the product I sprayed in my yield loss experiment, which we discussed yesterday. <coughs> 